Okay, um, hello, good afternoon and welcome uh, everybody to the second uh, NHFT uh, member event for 22-23. Um, this is still a bit of a new venture for us um, here at um, NHFT, so it'd be really great for, for your feedback um, at the end of the session to inform uh, future uh, sessions. Um, my name is Richard, I'm from the governance team and my role this afternoon simply is to uh, to host, so you won't be hearing too much more from me, which is probably um, a good thing. I'm um, really pleased this afternoon to be joined by Mandy Wolfe, who is our Voluntary Services um, Manager. Uh, Mandy has very kindly offered to take us through uh, some of what um, our, the volunteering team uh, are doing here with people at uh, NHFT. So we've got about 30 minutes worth of um, uh, information from uh, Mandy, which is a, a mix of slides and, and, and video content. And then there'll be plenty of opportunity after that to ask questions and to have a discussion, uh, I think, really. So what we would ask is um, if you would sort of hold your questions to the end so that we can then take them all at, at once. Having said that, if you wish to put your question in the chat, please do, and we will we'll pick them up um, at the end. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Mandy, to uh, take us through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. One of the reasons you've got me uh, this particular time is because, as you may be aware, it's National Volunteers Week. Um, and today is the last day of National Volunteers Week. Obviously, that has been affected by the Jubilee ce celebrations. We lost a few days, but this is Ben's Volunteers Week. So it's quite a nice time for me to share with you what's happening in the trust. So, um, Rich has already covered some of these things, so um, sort of a virtual housekeeping, if you like. Um, this is a safe, safe space to say anything that you wanted to. It's an opportunity to ask me questions at the end. Um, we won't need any breaks um, in this session. It is going to hopefully be about half an hour's content. Um, and I think you're all fairly familiar with using Teams. So there is the chat function. You can always pop a question into that chat function as we go. I won't answer any questions till we get to the end because it can be a bit distracting and sometimes you lose um, track of where you are. Um, there's the raise hand function, which we could use when we are doing questions at the end, if that's possible. Um, and if we can keep ourselves on mute until we answer the questions and you can or cannot have your camera on, it's up to you what you want to do regarding your camera. So the aim of the session today is to provide you information about volunteering and to build an understanding of the definition of volunteering, the recruitment processes, the benefits and challenges, and some of the opportunities available to give you some ideas. So first of all, I just wanted to say, what is volunteering? Some people's interpretation of volunteering is different. Um, so the National Council for Voluntary Organisation defines volunteering as an activity that involves spending time unpaid doing something that aims to benefit the environment or someone, individuals or groups other than or in addition to close relatives. And it's very important that volunteering must be a choice freely made by each person. So there is some confusion, as I said, um, these are the things that we don't class as volunteering. So an internship is not volunteering. Work experience, student placements is, are not. They are requirements often of an educational pathway. So that is not somebody giving time um, pure, for purely no benefit. Um, and mandatory work, um, again that that's not a volunteering opportunity so we just wanted to be very clear you know volunteering is different to all of those things we do have other areas within the trust that will cover work experience and student placements but it's not doesn't come under volunteer voluntary services so over the last two and a half years particularly um NHFT's voluntary services has grown quite massively. So pre-pandemic, it was myself as a voluntary services manager and I have one a volunteer coordinator. Um, but we put lots in place um, at the beginning of the pandemic um, and my team has grown from two of us to a team of eight. So we very clearly now split into sort of four different areas. So we have the mental health and community volunteers. So that covers all the community services, the community hospitals and all the mental health hospitals and services where we might have volunteers. Also in June 2020, we took over the voluntary services management for the hospices. So that's Cynthia Spencer Hospice and Cransley Hospice. Um, and this brought with it 
around about 150 to 180 volunteers as well. So we have a similar amount um, under mental health and community um, volunteering as well. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we set up a befriending service, and I'll go on to talk about that a little bit later. So that's another area. And we also set up uh, last year, about a, just over a year ago now, a volunteer to career pathway. Again, I go on to talk about that a little bit later. So we have over 300 volunteers across the whole of the trust, including the hospices. Um, and, and this picture represents actually our band. Um, they're volunteers who go into Berrywood Hospital. They call themselves the Woodberries. See what they did there. Um, and they have been with us for about three years now. And they go in on a Tuesday afternoon um, and play um, to the patients and the staff who absolutely love it. Um, they play a lot of um, 60s music and they are just brilliant. Um, and so they did a sort of caricature of the um, or cartoon, made a cartoon out of our, um, our band, the Woodberries, and they, they've been brilliant. So there's lots of benefits to volunteering. I just listed some here. People volunteer for all different reasons. Um, some just you know, feel they want to make a difference. For others, it might be a case of getting out the house and meeting new people. Some people do it to build their self-esteem and sense of purpose. It also improves people's well-being and quality of life. Um, often people that retire um, can find themselves at a loose end. And by volunteering in retirement can give them a better quality of life and keep them getting out, meeting people and having a sense of purpose, which is great. Um, it also helps um, with ill health. So if they are perhaps struggling with their own mental health, actually going in to do a voluntary role um, is really helpful for them. It goes back to the sense of purpose and giving back, meeting new people and building confidence. It's also an opportunity for some people in some roles, they may learn new skills, and this could be really helpful if perhaps they're looking um, at going on to take, do paid work in the future, and they could pick up some skills through volunteering, which, which they could actually add to their CV, which will improve their chances of getting a job further down the line. They can gain experience and improve their CV, as I mentioned, so, so the skills would be part of that. But also it may be that they feel like they want to um, get paid work in the health service um, and by volunteering they can dip their toe in the water gain a bit of experience and improve their CV because they've got that experience now and it gives them a chance to see is this really what I want to do for a paid work as I say it's just dipping your toe in the water without making that commitment um, into a paid job. Volunteers are also able to sort of shape services. Um, we have Involvees too, which is a different team um, that are more involved in the shaping services. They are people who have a lived experience and can share their experience to help shape different services across the trust. And you know, it's an opportunity to have your voice heard as well. So the benefits for the trust um, and different teams and departments involving volunteers, um, it can improve patients' happiness and health. Um, volunteers can give that extra time to patients. If you think of the community beds, for example, our volunteers go in and they actually befriend patients. They might sit by their bedside and just chat to them, read to them, play a game with them. Um, you know, they do the, the drinks trolleys and they just have more time than the nurses do are trying to do the clinical um, and um, personal care for patients. This is just enhancing those services um, and improving the patient experience. It can improve staff well-being and morale because having those extra people in to do some of those tasks, um, it might be um, doing things like putting stock away for them, answering the phones, dealing with some of the bells that are ringing that um, a volunteer could deal with. It might be getting a glass of water for a patient, for example, that a volunteer could quite easily do. So it will improve staff well-being and the morale, just having those extra people around and improve staff productivity because they're not caught, get caught up with some of the things that somebody else could come along and do. Improves efficiency um, and also um, increases interest in an NHS career. So that's what I said before. People come in to dip their toe in the water to see if they want to work within healthcare. 
Um, so it's given people that opportunity. Um, so hopefully they will go on to become paid members of staff, enjoy the team in that way. And it has a positive impact on the volunteer too, because they feel like they're really making a difference and helping and supporting the NHS. So we talked about the, the benefits of volunteering, but of course there are some challenges um, and barriers for some people. Um, people, particularly nowadays um, with the cost of fuel, um, traveling expenses, um, could put volunteering out of reach for some people. Our policy is that people can claim out of pocket expenses. So this could cover, cover their travel to and from their place of volunteering. We are quite careful when we place our volunteers because we don't want them to be traveling 50, 60 miles round trip to their volunteering um, opportunity. So we try to keep them as local as we can because also that puts pressures on um, the, the department budgets too. But we do pay expenses so people will be covered if they're uh, going on the bus or if they're getting in the car, they'll get petrol um, or fuel expenses there. Getting there. So some people may find a challenge, um, you know, in getting there. So some people that don't drive might struggle to get public transport. So it's things that people need to think about. The commitment to volunteering, sometimes that can be a challenge. We ask for a minimum of three hours a week. Um, for a six month period. And the reason we ask for that commitment is because the length of time it takes us to recruit volunteers. Um, volunteers really go through uh, almost um, a recruitment process uh, as a member of staff would. And I'll go on to that a little bit later. So we ask for just three hours a week for six months. So we hope that's acceptable to most people. Some people do more than that, but that's our minimum requirement. Some people might find it challenging to meet new people, but we try to make that process as, as pleasant as possible and make sure we have support in place for anybody that might feel a bit anxious about meeting new people. We make sure you, you're budded up with somebody um, and that there's always people around that you can help, uh, that will help you and you can ask any questions of. There are quite a few training requirements to become a volunteer. Again, uh, that might be a challenge for some people who maybe don't have a computer or a laptop um, or even a smartphone that they can do their training on. But we will always find ways around helping you and supporting you to do that. Um, there is quite a lot of training, as I say, particularly um, for people that maybe want to move into our volunteer to career pathway. Some people might be concerned um, um, regarding a DBS check. So a DBS is a disclosure and barring service. This is checking uh, your criminal record. So some people may be concerned because they have disclosures on their DBS that that might stop them from volunteering. That's not true. We will look at each case on a case by case basis. And if the information on the DBS is concerning, then we would risk assess that person and look for a suitable role that would be well supported to enable them to continue to volunteer. And you don't have to pay as a volunteer for a DBS, it is free. Um, for a member of staff, they would have to pay for their DBS, but volunteers, they are free. Another challenge could be around providing references. Um, some people might think, oh, I've got nobody that want, would give me a good reference. Um, again, we, we do normally get around that. There's not usually a problem with that at all. It is a personal reference, so it's not an employer reference. So, you know, even if it's, um, it, you know, somebody that's been your neighbour for a while that knows you that can just say that you would be suitable to be a volunteer, that would be absolutely fine. Some people might also be concerned, particularly uh, where we are at the moment, about keeping safe and that might be related to COVID. Um, and we want to reassure everybody that we have lots of processes in place to keep people safe. We are still uh, social distances at the moment. We are still wearing masks. Um, but also, if you're maybe volunteering in mental health services, you might be concerned about um, patients that might be aggressive towards you. Well, we do everything we can um, to make it as safe as possible. And you will be given the training and support to be able to do that. So as I mentioned earlier, Volunteer to Career is a, is a new pathway we set up just over a year ago. And this was on the back of um, a national project, which was to increase our healthcare support workers across the NHS, because there was a huge gap, um, you know, lots of vacancies for these positions. And so this, these, this project was set up to see how we could 
increase our healthcare support workers in each of our trusts. So we looked at it within our trust and I happened to drop that into the chat box when we were in one of the meetings and that I was thinking of putting together a volunteer to career pathway because I, I know previous to this new project we had lots of people coming through who wanted to gain experience. We also knew at that time that many people had lost their jobs through the pandemic and there were lots of people that had all the right skills and qualities that you would want in healthcare, uh, maybe from hospitality, but they didn't have the necessary experience um, to be able to get in, uh, paid work with us um, so they wouldn't actually get through the shortlisting process because of lack of experience. So this pathway we put together um, so we could widen participation and improve accessibility to people. This might be great for people that, that are in, unemployed um, and without recent work experience or references. It's great for people that need a more gradual route into work. And this might be due to being off work for quite a long time. It might be that because they've had children or they've been caring for family members. Um, they could be disabled or neurodivergent and need that gradual route in. So this was particularly looking at people that weren't able to access paid work through the normal channels. And it also a chance for people that are looking for a change in career. So we do have people coming through to us that do work full time. They work in a, diff in a different um, environment and they're quite interested in becoming um, somebody that works within healthcare. So th th again, this is an opportunity for them to continue to work full time, but, but uh, fit some volunteering in around that. So that could be in the evenings, it could be at weekends. So it's a chance to dip your toe in the water, as we mentioned earlier. And if people are not sure if career in healthcare is for them, it's just a chance to try before you apply. And that was our tagline for this new project. Um, we have a volunteer coordinator who we took on at the time to literally coordinate this project um, for me. Um, and they are the person that will um, look at all applications coming in and anybody that's identified that they're interested in a career change, um, they would go through my volunteer to career coordinator who would keep sight of them and um, so that they would do their volunteering that they have to do at the beginning because you have to do 40 hours of volunteering before you can be considered for the pathway and that's just really to make sure that it's right for you and it's right for us so I've got my volunteer to a career coordinator would just keep track of all those people that have expressed an interest at application and follow up with them when they've done their 40 hours to see if um, a career in healthcare is what they want and then we would put them onto the appropriate training and this training um, will give them access to the care certificate so through volunteering they will complete their care certificate which is nationally recognised and they could use in any other NHS trust but it's um, a certificate that will allow them to have that experience to go on to apply for paid work and that might be through our staff bank or it might be a substantive post um, that comes up. Again, I mentioned that we set up a befriending service. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, we realised that there were many of our service users and patients that would be particularly lonely and isolated through that first lockdown. Through that first lockdown, we stood down all of our volunteers. And for this, um, it, for some of our volunteers, this was particularly hard. Volunteering was a big part of their life and not having that anymore left them, them themselves quite lonely and isolated. We also were aware that um, there was the um, NHS responders that had been set up and there was a huge pouring of support for the NHS responders. And we were asked as a trust to make sure we use these um, people that have applied um, for the, to be an NHS responder. So we put all of those things together so we could use our volunteers, we could support our service users and patients, and we could also refer people in to the NHS responders who were able to go do people shopping, pick up prescriptions, etc. So we set up a befriending service in April 2020. We put it together very quickly with our clinical systems teams. And we really didn't know how well it would go. And we selected three or four of our volunteers who had experience in working with people with mental health issues. Um, as I say, we had no idea how it would go. We set it up in April 2020 and it has just continued to rise and the numbers have been astounding. So about a month ago, um, so which would have been about two years, we've made seven and a half thousand calls to service users and patients and we've supported over 200 people. 
with about 32 volunteers now. We some of those volunteers have come and gone. We we have a sort of stable base of about 18 to 20 volunteers that's that sit on the service with us and we make about 80 calls a week at the moment. And we were absolutely thrilled and delighted to be finalists in the HSJ Awards for our befriending service. So myself and my befriending administrator um, went to London um, to see if we were going to win the award. We didn't unfortunately win, but we were a finalist, which is a fantastic achievement in itself. So we were so very proud of everybody that um, put the befriending service together and all of our volunteers that give up so much of their time um, to call people who are lonely and isolated. What we did realise, um, you know, we thought this might just last for, for the pandemic, but we realised quite quickly that people are lonely and isolated with or without a pandemic and they do need that person calling them just a friendly ear, somebody to talk to um, who calls them regularly, once a week normally, um, just so that they can chat about anything they want, not their health conditions, but, you know, they might want to talk about the garden, their pets, what they're going to have for dinner, just general chit chat. And this saves a lot of uh, clinical time and because a lot of people, when they see the doctor, they might just want to chat about everyday things, whereas our callers, our volunteer callers can take that time away from the doctors, the doctors um, and clinical staff can support patients um, in a clinical capacity and they're supporting them in a more of a social interaction capacity. So we're very, very proud of our befriending service. So the befriending service isn't the only area where people can volunteer. Here are some examples of different opportunities we have across the trust. So we have ward assistants um, and they are generally in the community beds and we have community hospitals all over the county, um, Daventry, Wellingborough, Corby, uh, for example. And this role would be about um, befriending patients and helping with the tea trolleys, helping feed patients. Um, just doing anything really that the nurses um, need you to do, answering bells, answering phones, doing some general admin. So there's lots to do the ward assistant roles. We also have volunteer drivers and they are predominantly based at the hospices. So they used to do lots of driving pre-pandemic and then when everything, all this face-to-face -face, um, meetings ended, the drivers weren't able to do very much driving. But in the last six months, we've managed to get around about 15 of our drivers back in the hospices and they drive patients um, from their home um, into the hospices to attend face-to-face -face meetings and then they will take them home again and this is for people who have no other way of getting to and from their appointments. So they um, ha have all the PPE in their in their cars and they have all the protocols in place to be able to do that so that's a great example of uh, uh, volunteers. Also in the hospices, we have reception cover. Uh, there's no staff that cover reception in either of the hospices. So reception is, is only covered by volunteers and that's from eight in the morning till eight at night, um, seven days a week. So we have people doing Saturdays and Sundays um, and they generally do two to three hours a, a week on reception. Um, yeah, a week on reception. Um, that's the shifts, two or three hours. So they are meeting and greeting um, visitors, they're answering phones, they might be doing um, some bits of paperwork for the staff um, and they're there really, as I say, meet and greet people as they come through. Um, hospitality assistance, this is fairly new. We started um, working with our estates team and we've started getting people in to help in the cafes. So they might be clearing tables, cleaning down the tables, stocking up, um, and, and doing a bit of cleaning here and there. And this, so this is a fairly new role and it's a role we've developed because we want to bring more people in um, from a learning disabilities background. Um, and we've, we've had one just started at St Mary's Hospital um, who's going in on a Monday and Tuesday doing four hours each day and just doing those things I described. And I absolutely love it. And they're a breath of fresh air um, in the department. So we're trying to increase that throughout the um, throughout the trust in our different cafes across across the county. The telephone befriender I've already spoken about, so they give up sort of half a day um, a week to make the telephone calls. And then we have people who are supporting our occupational therapy teams and they might be involved in group sessions, they might be in, involved in face-to-face uh, -face sessions, individuals, um, and just generally supporting uh, the therapy teams. 
we have lots of administrator roles um, all across the trust um, and we have gardeners as well and again they're all over the trust we have lots of gardeners in the hospice again we don't have any paid um, gardeners um, so the gardening team do an awful lot of work in the in the grounds of um, both the hospices and, th and that's just um a bit of a snapshot of some of the roles, but we are always looking to adapt um, and develop roles as we go to suit individuals. So it's a case of matching individuals to the best opportunity for them. We've done an awful lot of work in the last uh, year, really, on diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, we recognise the ben benefits of diversity. We want to bring people in from all different backgrounds and walks of life. People's lived experience adds a huge value to many different services, and there are a wide range of roles available to people. It's open to everyone. Volunteering is open to everybody, and I want to make that really clear. And no prior work experience is needed to volunteer, and training is provided, and we cover um, reasonable out-of-pocket expenses. And we also will make reasonable adjustments for anybody. But it's, it's really high on our agenda. Um, this year and we're working more around diversity and inclusion and we're doing lots of work um, on our training, on our application forms to make easy read versions and make it as accessible as possible to anybody that wants to come in and volunteer. So the, this next slide is about how to become a volunteer. So this is actually the process behind um, being recruited as a volunteer. So you would apply by filling out an application form. Um, we have our application forms on an MS forms link, but we also have sort of paper versions too. We have it in lots of many different ways. Um, but MS forms um, is a great link because you can complete the application on a tablet, on a smartphone, on a laptop computer. It's it's very accessible and very easy to use, and it's easy easily comes into us um, to be um, looked at. Once we've received the application form, we would arrange to have an informal chat with that person. And this could be in person, um, on the phone, or, you know, we can even, or, always set up video calls as well. It depends on the individual, how they would like to have that chat. But this chat is all about getting to know that person, getting to know what their availability is, what they like to do. Um, and just discussing what the next steps are going to be, because as I mentioned, there is quite a process to becoming a volunteer. It's not a case of turning up one day and volunteering the next. It is a four to six weeks uh, process to get people cleared to volunteer. And that's because we have a duty of care to our volunteers, but also to the staff and the patients that they're going to be volunteering with. So we have to make sure all those checks um, are done and the training is complete. So there is a health uh, declaration that has to be completed and um, this goes to our occupational health team. If um, you've disclosed that you have any health conditions, then you would have to fill out, uh, fill out a full health questionnaire. Um, our occupational health team will work with you um, and make sure that we have everything in place for you to volunteer and will send us a, a clearance certificate once that's done. Um, there's no um, bypass in this. It is something that has to be done, particularly if you're on site. Then there is the DBS. So not all roles require a DBS, but any anyone that has um, patient contact on a regular basis would need to have a DBS. And mostly they would be enhanced because the people we're dealing with are vulnerable people. But as I say, not every role requires it. It, it depends what role you might be doing. And then there's the training. So there's, um, there's eight modules of mandatory training that have to be done as a volunteer and all things you'd expect like health and safety, fire, information governance um, and, and a few more. But depending on your role, there might be some additional training you might do to make the, your role easier to carry out. And then at the end, when you're fully cleared, there'll be a volunteer agreement to sign, which cl lay clearly lays out what our expectations of you and what you can expect from us. And there's a code of conduct that we ask you to read um, and raise any questions you might have about that. So. I'm just going to go back to this one. We, we do have a little um, video um, of some of our volunteers that have been befrienders that Richard is going to share for me. Um, it's, it's quite interesting to hear actually what volunteering means to them. Um, and I think it's a nice way to end this presentation. And, and then I'll go on and take any questions um, and comments you might have. So, Richard, if you wouldn't mind playing that for me, please. I 
have 10 completely different um, individuals, each with their own wants and needs. Um, some, it's just a glorious chat and a good old moan about the state of the universe and everything else. At the other end of the spectrum, I've got people um, who have, uh, have got some fairly serious uh, mental health concerns. I've been sort of basically phoning people now three three days a week. Um, it does vary, so I usually do about six or seven calls a week in those three days. Um, so over the 18 months, I've probably amounted to about 500 calls now since I started. And um, we, we talk about goals, but then I introduced this person to the concepts of, of elephant eating. We were setting small goals, and that was the whole point of it. How do you eat? And we, we, the next week we talked, well, how much of the elephant did you eat today? Well, like, you know, 2%. Well, okay, that's pretty good, you know. I, I got something through the post via the office, obviously, because my, my address is not uh, known, um, from this person. And it's very special to me. And uh, if you can see it, it's a... Uh, it's a small elephant with my name on it, and uh, I must be honest, it's, it, you know, that's a, something that I'll treasure forever. The lady who helped me was a huge support throughout the last year or so since I've been receiving these calls. I've been undergoing therapy for a lifetime of abuse, and I've struggled through lockdown immensely. And due to all the restrictions, I struggle to cope with everything. In truth, if I hadn't had these phone calls, I wouldn't be here right now. My befriender literally saved my life and I haven't the words to thank her for getting me through this last year. This service is absolutely amazing. This is what our, our clients think of this service. Um, and I think it highlights um, what an incredibly good service this is and how highly it's regarded by the people who use our service. I get a lot out of the phoning myself. It's doing me a lot of good as well, considering what I've gone through personal um, with losing my wife. And um, it's all positive for me. I think being a volunteer for me has had a profound impact on my life. I have been a service user at NHFT for 10 years. Um, and certainly for eight years, I've not worked. I'm now in a really, really fortunate position where my volunteering has led me to find full time employment. And so I'm just about to join uh, another local trust to be a lived experience lead. And so having the opportunity and the support from NHFT staff to become a volunteer has been amazing. So uh, that's the end of our presentation. Um, I don't know if anybody has got any questions or comments they want to make. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, but I thought it actually says it all really, what volunteering means to people and what a difference it can have on their lives as well. Brilliant, thanks so much. Um, Mandy and Cindy, whilst people are thinking of questions, I was just really struck by the significant increase in um, volunteering that has happened, uh, perhaps as a result of the, the, the pandemic. but. Certainly, it seems that there's a huge range of different opportunities available for people wanting to to get involved and to to, to volu volunteer. I mean, ha have you noticed that the um, the range of opportunities has changed, or is it simply the number of people volunteering that's that, that's increased during this time? I think um, with the pandemic, it's given us a chance to because we stood down our volunteers at the beginning. It gave us a chance to almost stand back and look at what we have got and, and what we need. Some of the roles haven't come back um, because services have changed significantly, but it has led to other opportunities. You know, the befriending service is another opportunity um, and volunteers were asked for, you know, support in the vaccination centre, for example. Um, so there's been different opportunities over the last couple of years. And, and I think because um, you know, the great press the NHS has had through the pandemic, it's made people want to come in and volunteer. So we've had perhaps a different 
type of people coming through, um, people that want to make a difference and want to help and support the NHS. So, um, yes, yeah, some of it is is roles um, as they were, but a lot of it is looking at um, the roles being slightly changed and tailored to how we're working today really so some of those roles are from home which we never had volunteers really working from home before so the befriending services working from home we've had um, other uh, volunteers who have been supporting services and doing virtual sort of webinars you know being involved in supporting people that way so yeah it's changed quite significantly actually and, and the people that we've got coming through has the types of people have changed as well Fantastic. So I don't know whether anybody does have any questions. I've, I've certainly got a couple more, but I'll just offer it out to anybody else that wants to come in at this point. Uh, yes, if I, if I may come in, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a trustee and treasurer of Kettering Mind, and I actually started my association with Kettering Mind as a volunteer, uh, which I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, rather sadly, as as you've said, unfortunately, my normal volunteering session was a Wednesday afternoon between two and four o'clock when we basically had an open house, which everybody enjoyed. It was great fun. Cup of tea, cup of coffee, played cards, whatever. And unfortunately, of course, during COVID that closed and we haven't as yet, although hopefully soon we'll be in a position to restart it. But it was actually very fulfilling because as a result of being a volunteer, several other issues cropped up. And, uh, you know, that's the reason I actually became so involved with Kettering Mind. The only criticism of some volunteers, and I've heard it made in one or two of the um, hospital comments where I'm also a governor, is that when the going gets tough, sometimes some of the volunteers opt out, and of course they're not paid, so you can't, you haven't any stick with which mm. to beat them. So I think it's important that you do actually choose the, the people who do have a commitment. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Andrew. Yes, I think it's an important point. So, with you, want to comment, Mandy? Um. Yes, I think it, it's it's true. I mean, we have still found that there's some of our volunteers um, are still reluctant to come back. Uh, you know that they, although we have got virtually all our roles back, uh, you know, operational in the last six months, there are still a few that are very wary about coming back, and and some that you know keep on saying, "Oh, well, come back to me in a month, come back," you know, and, it, and then sort of two years later, they haven't been volunteering, and yeah, and we're yeah. not likely to get them back, and and we can't keep their oh, um, no. their records indefinitely, so we have to be a bit no. harsh and say, you mm. know, but yes, there's. Um, there's some that do find it quite challenging and they mm. they don't want to perhaps follow the protocols that we have in place um, and so you yeah. lose some people because of that yeah. for example we we, um, we have our volunteers in uniform this year and that has had a few challenges in itself they some of them didn't want to wear uniform um and particularly at the hospices funnily enough just one particular hospice we had a lot of challenges around that we didn't we lost about two in the end out of 160 mm. odd which wasn't bad but we you know we the trouble is in and I think you know with the generals I because I, I know my counterparts in there I know there can be an element of people that feel the volunteers feel they sort of rule the roost a little bit and um and won't comply you know don't feel that they should because they're not paid and so we have to sort of manage that situation sometimes um but mo you know most of our volunteers are brilliant yeah. and will comply and will do what we we need them to do Oh yes, I can yes. I can entirely understand that. I I personally was a little bit disappointed when the COVID thing first blew up. As a ex GP, I volunteered to become a vaccinator and did all the protocols. It took me an awfully long time. Then they said mm. they wanted me. Then they didn't want me. Thank you very much, Andrew. We don't need you. And fair enough. But then when I went and had my own jabs, I was a little bit annoyed. I was given the jab by a nurse who I actually knew quite well because she lives in our village. And I thought, well, if I'd be doing the jabs, that nurse could have been on the ward where she was much more useful than I would have been. Mm. So I think also the problem with volunteering, some of the admin over volunteering, particularly in the over the COVID situation, hasn't mm. been perfect, you know. Mm. Yeah. I don't know really why I was turned down, but but I suppose I'm I'm 77 and it may be they thought I was too old. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, thank you. I, I think you're, you're right, uh, Andrew, in getting the right balance, isn't it, really, between the, the right amount of checks and, and, and support, yeah. given that we're mm. um, working with potentially vulnerable people, but not so much bureaucracy, as you say, that it's putting people off and thinking, goodness, is that the amount of stuff that I need to do? Um, this is feeling rather mm. onerous. So I, I think you're right. And it's important to keep reviewing that, I think, because it's easy yeah. for things to creep in, isn't it? There's additional requirements over time. Yeah, it's like you said, it's yeah. getting that balance right, isn't it? And I know mm. Tracy and Richard will both know how long it took us to get um, a training package together that was appropriate and relevant yeah. to volunteer roles instead of putting them through all this hours and hours of online training which actually didn't you know when they were coming in for a couple of hours a week it, it was totally over the top really so we work we, yes. we work very hard with the other teams and you know to say to keep it relevant and appropriate really where we can thank you okay uh, chris yeah thank you can you hear me okay everyone mm -hmm. yeah well um yeah sure two things first of all in the in terms of full disclosure i'm also a trustee at Kettering Remind, as along with, with Andrew, so I thought I'd better declare that. But the one thing we do have in common is that we are all volunteers, and, and I want to salute you, Mandy, for expertly and skillfully taking us through the current situation with, with volunteer, um, both at a sort of day-to-day -day level, but also in terms of the future. And in, in an indirect way, you're my boss because I'm a volunteer. <laughs> and and um, it's interesting, isn't there, that, as you say, those stories at the end of individuals that describe them as life changing or having a profound impact. And I just wanted to reflect on three things, if I may. When I was in my last substantive role in a in a trust that had three sites, we had a thousand volunteers. Now that's something like, I think I worked it out, it was like 25% of the workforce, not, not, not in the traditional sense, but they had, all had red polo shirts mm -hmm. and they were an army beavering around the hospital. And that unpaid contribution does not always get the recognition it deserves. And that leads me on to my second point, which pre-pandemic, do you remember we talked about, I always had this, forgive me, it sounds a bit big-headed, I always had this vision of having a tiered approach to membership where we always say, well, what, whether it's Kettering General asks, what's the benefit of becoming a member? So membership could lead to, for example, consultation. So if there was a uh, for example, the trust was consulting on the future provision of learning disability services or at Kettering, the future provision of cardiac services. A member might want to be um, consulted on that. That could lead to involvement, which I think for mental health services, Andrew, is a little bit more of that golden thread. That's that's far more yeah. um, part of what we do on a day to day basis. That sort of, as you described, Mandy, in involvees, co-production that could lead to volunteering and that in turn could lead to careers. And with the shortage of workforce that, that we're facing as an NHS, both locally and nationally, this idea of the um, volunteer to career pathway, I think is wonderful, yeah, you know, because we, we have to find ways of creating a new workforce, a diverse workforce. And the final point, and, and I say this as a man of a certain age, is that we are living longer because of benefits in healthcare. And one thing I would suggest is that volunteering does offer an identity and a purpose, which is really important. Um, and because loneliness, we can all be guilty of whether you're young, old, you know, at every age. Mm. And we know the facts speak themselves in that it, it's as bad as what, smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So the befriending service is wonderful you know and just keeping in touch with people i know staff that they were at the library in lockdown were ringing people who were um what was that phrase they were they had to really stay stay behind closed doors you know they were very oh, i can't think vulnerable of it. thank Extremely you vulnerable. Vulnerable. Yeah. that's it um and they found that you know weekly whatever call hugely beneficial so i think it it is really important that we embrace this this whole idea of volunteering, not as an add-on, but as a mainstream, yeah, part of our day-to-day -day activity. And and I think 
sometime in the future, we might want to dust down our patient and public involvement strategy, which weaves in all of this involvee, co-production, you know, governors, whether it be KGH or us, as volunteers and what and what we bring. But it's a bigger issue for society, I think, um, in terms of how we're trying to respond to the, the needs of locally, but also the workforce needs of the NHS. So thank you, Mandy, generally. Thank you on behalf of the Council thank of you. Governors as lead governor. Thank you for what you're doing. I'm thrilled that you've gone from two people to, to eight. You've got a coordinator for this um, career, a uh, volunteer to career. One thing I did want to ask, and you might want to share, and with another hat of, I'm aware of the volunteer passport, you know, and we gave a presentation mm -hmm. on that in our Action for Happiness role a couple of weeks ago, and I know NHFT is part of that. Do, do you want, are you in a position to share some perhaps? Uh, yes, I can, I can share a little bit, yes. So yeah. we've been working alongside the GP Alliance, um, who are responsible for the, the volunteer passport in the county. Um, it is in its very early stages at the moment, and we have signed up as a provider. Um, I'm not sure how well it's going to work for us, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, being an NHS trust, um, because we have very strict guidelines on on the training that has to be done and it has to meet certain standards, etc. But we're, we're working around that. So I don't feel that we can put all of our roles on that volunteer passport platform. So this is a this is the platform where um, any um, health related organisation can advertise volunteer roles. So it's not just for NHS Trust, it could be, it could be different organisations too. Uh, so anybody that's interested in sort of healthcare, um, but it is, uh, there's certain training that they would do, the, the passport, uh, the platform does, the, you know, the DBS checks and bits and pieces like that, but well, they have made it much more flexible now than when it was originally set up. So each organisation can um, bring that person in, but then have their own uh, routes in to become a volunteer because say we would have DBS checks, we'd have Oki health checks, for example, we would have other training that, that, that wouldn't meet what's on the platform, what's on the passport. Um, so, so it's work in progress, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we have got a couple of roles we've advertised on there, which is because we're quite desperate for drivers, volunteer drivers, and we're quite desperate for befrienders all the time. We need to constantly replenish our befrienders. So we put those two roles up there um, to hopefully, um, it's just, it's just somewhere else to advertise those roles. But um, I know, for example, our reception volunteers who are mm -hmm. sort of a retired uh, cohort of people generally, um, wouldn't want to be recording their hours week by week on this its platform. So it's it, it's it has its, its swings and roundabouts, I think, at the moment. And so it's all in the very early stages and there's lots of learning and development of it going on. And, and we're working with them. I, I meet with them regularly and we we feed into what's happening and and what it looks like from our point of view and what would work for us and what doesn't really. So, um, yeah. yeah. Just if I may, just oh, plug myself in. I think the, the benefit of doing it through the GPA is that, let's be clear, those of us on the call, we have a certain degree of agency, of social capital. We get it. Whereas those who don't have that sense of social capital, so might see their GP and be prescribed a volunteering as a way to help. The idea of the volunteer passport is it opens up different routes to volunteering over and above the formal routes that Mandy's described if you wanted to come into NHFT or Andrew with KGH. So, yeah, we're, it, it's, it's good to test something, you know, and see how it goes. Um, but it will then help, as, as you've described, Mandy, that people who might be struggling with low level mental health problems not acute that the GP as part of social prescribing might suggest well look what what about considering doing a volunteer role because that will help you and build your self-esteem which in turn will help you feel being part of a community so yeah it has its problems as you say but nonetheless I think it's best to try and not try at all if you know what I mean yeah mm -hmm. thanks Chris I think some, some important points and just a Add a perspective from, from from me. I think I think you're right to uh, to, to bring us back to the patient and public involvement strategy because I think after all, what we're here to do, our sort of mission is about making a difference to people's lives for and with them. And I think what we've what we've certainly learned over the last twenty or so years is we can make a difference to people's lives not just by treating them. 
but by allowing them opportunities to get involved and to participate and, and what benefits you can get yourself from volunteering and supporting somebody else's recovery mm -hmm. and somebody else's life and I think some of the examples and case studies that we've heard have really reflected not just the impact that a volunteer has had for a patient a person that we're treating in inverted commas but also the impact that it's had for the volunteer themselves a couple of examples in the videos I think were quite powerful mm -hmm. um, yeah. from my point yeah. of view too and I think I think you're right also Chris with what you were saying about being clear well what is the what is the offer and let's make it a flexible mm. offer actually mm -hmm. because yeah. there are different ways in which people want and can contribute and we're certainly not looking to exclude people we are looking within the sort of tram lines that Mandy was describing in staying safe and legal um, to support people to volunteer in different ways and I think the the advent of the pandemic in some ways a, a, a terrible uh, set of circumstances had led to innovations such as the befriending service and I think it really interests me is almost what's what's next Mandy are there any any new ideas that you're sort of working on at the moment in terms of what's the future of volunteering are there some exciting things that you can talk to us about now or any sense even where you where you might be heading next uh, well, one of the things I did sort of allude to it earlier in the presentation is that we're really, really keen to develop um, more pathways under the volunteer to career. So at the moment, that was originally set up to support healthcare support workers coming in. Mm. So we particularly tailored it for that. But the pathway um, can be developed. So, you know, for example, um, this is something that came out of the volunteer to career we didn't expect at all is that lots of members of staff have come to us um, because they are doing portering, mm. they're doing reception, they're doing a, they're a domestic and they suddenly seen this opportunity and they've always wanted to get into healthcare mm. and, and, and this is an opportunity for them that they never had before. So we've had a number of, volunteer, uh, of volunteers who were staff, who are staff, coming through the volunteer to career pathway to get the training at in volunteering to go and do some volunteering in the ward settings um, and they successfully now either been taken on to bank to as well as their paid role they're doing additional bank shifts to cover healthcare support workers it wasn't what we expected at all from that so we're really keen to develop different pathways and so what what's happening is we're losing some admins um, and so we we want to develop a pathway um, for admin roles. So we're looking at actually what does a band two, three admin person mm. need? Because um, we have lots of people actually applying mm. who want to do an admin role or reception role, but and it's and they really want to learn it. It's not that they already have those skills. They'd like to to develop that. So we we are looking at that an admin um, pathway. We're working with the. Um, the AHPs and developing a pathway with them too, um, and also people returning to practice. So, so we've got our fingers in lots of pies at the moment, um, but we've been really concentrating on the healthcare support worker. And the other one was about p bringing people in with learning disabilities. Mm. So, you know, we have, <laughs> we've um, engaged with um, Daventry Hill School mm -hmm. um, recently, and we've got 16 applications from their students sort of 16 17 year olds um so we're brilliant. this is going to be very gradual because it's a large volume to place and they really all want to go to daintree which is you know we've got to be aware that it's going to put lots of pressures on the staff teams there um, and actually we're looking at maybe developing more group volunteering for them so they might come in in twos and threes rather than individually mm. um but it's it's something I need additional funding for because I need somebody that can be a support worker almost in, in voluntary services who will support those people with special needs, mm. give them that time, you know, to do the training and to do the all the other bits and pieces, but also to do some team prep with all the teams to prepare them to take people that might have additional needs and learning disabilities and how they can support them. So that's uh, that's where we're going with the sort of that element, really. Fantastic. Sounds really exciting, actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, Chris. Yeah, can I come in on two points, really? It was um, just something you've just said, actually, Mandy, is that in a way, historically, volunteers have gone to organisations, you know, because of perhaps of background like Andrew. And by the way, Andrew, you do not look your age you described, OK? <laughs> Early 60s, my friend. Um, and I think we're, we're drawn to organisations because we believe in them and we, we, we have perhaps a history or a past. But actually, I always say as hospitals, healthcare facilities, we are a community within a community. And perhaps we need to look that way as much as people going that way. And I'm conscious of time, but I, and I would crave your indulgence on this. I, I, 
something you said earlier, Mandy, reminded me of a, a book I've been looking at called The Gap and the Game by Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. And I wondered if I could just share this with you as a bit of a quote. I paraphrase slightly, but I just think it sort of resonates with what you're trying to create. And it says, when you're doing something you genuinely love and you're doing it for someone else and the greater good, then you are intrinsically motivated and to have a healthy passion. You don't need to force things or prove yourself. You're playing the long game. You're playing your own game. You're not competing with anyone else. You're not measuring yourself against anyone else's standard. And I just I hope you don't mind. F forgive the indulgence. But opposed, as opposed to the world of work where you are paid, where, you know, Tracy, Richard, you know that. There's always a degree of comparison or, or edge. Whereas when you're volunteering, you give of your heart. I'm not saying you don't when you work. But please do not misunderstand me. Of course we do. In the nature of the work we do, we give of ourselves. And Mandy, you know, you, of course you do. You give you, yourself. But when you're volunteering, there's a different sort of reward. And I just thought that quote summed up a bit of what we were trying and what you were trying to convey. So thank you. Yeah. I think I think you're right, Chris. What I think what you're really trying to say, and always remind me, you know, when you're working, particularly in your early years, yes, you're competing. You probably want that next job. You want the promotion. I remember the first two or three meetings of my medical school in Sheffield. We we're all uh, rather pleased with ourselves. We're all doing this. We're all competing. We're all doing this, and he was doing better than she was and she was doing better than he was then as we got a bit older of course that didn't matter anymore we we're all reached our own level wherever we were and we were quite happy just doing our job and i think you're right that, that is the thing about volunteers we aren't competing against anybody we don't want anybody else's job usually and we just do it for the love of, of the job yes i think you're quite right Thanks for letting me share that, Richard. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you, Chris. I think a, a, a really relevant, uh, a relevant point, actually. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious, as you say, of time, but equally not wanting to curtail any discussion or questions that that, that, that people wish to, to have. So I don't know, are there any other uh, further questions or comments people want to put in before we um, move towards the uh, the finish line? How are you? Good? I was just going to. Oh, oh, so, sorry. sorry, Chris. I was just going to suggest um, that Mandy just explains where people can find the um, forms. I presume they're available on the website, the volunteer forms. Yeah, so if you head to volunteering on NHFT's um, involvement page, I believe it is, there's a link there to the application form um, and lots of frequently asked questions as well um, about volunteering. Um, we have, uh, we've had quite a lot of dealings with NHS England actually and, and they have used us as a case study through some of the media stuff they've been doing this week um, which is is great um, so yes we've got we've got quite a lot of fingers in pies and um, and we've got lots of trust that are actually coming to us and, and learning from our experience particularly with befriending service and also the volunteer to career um, and actually one of the questions that I forgot where I was going then for a minute uh, so we ha I have to complete because um, we got some funding from NHS England I have to complete um, some return forms and one of the questions was about um, you know with the projects that you were funded to do what are your suggestions, you know, going forward? And one of them is, um, which I sit in um, a Q&A for voluntary services managers. There's about 100 voluntary services managers across the county. And what surprises me, actually, is there's some trusts that put all their volunteer roles up on NHS jobs and volunteers are shortlisted. Now, I think that is not a good practice I, I understand you know some trusts have lots of volunteers coming in but if people are offering their time mm. I think that's quite a kick in the teeth if you're saying well actually thanks but no thanks um you know we never we will always look at every application mm. we have on an individual basis and have that informal chat there's not been many 
times we haven't been able to find something for somebody. Sometimes, you know, that person has maybe got paid work before they managed to start or they found another opportunity. But but we will always look at everybody on their own merit and they wouldn't be shortlisted um, and, and we wouldn't put it on, on NHS jobs. So um, that's one of the things I said to NHS England that I would suggest that's not a way that we recruit volunteers, particularly if you're wanting to increase the workforce, um, you know, and support people from all different backgrounds and um, experiences. So, um, yeah, I do, I do feel quite strongly about that. That's, um, it's not, in my opinion, it's not the right way to, to recruit volunteers and manage volunteers. Great. I just wondered if Bev had any thoughts or reflections. Sorry to put you on the spot, Bev, <laughs> but how have you found the, the discussion? You're on mute. Oh, I think the connection might be a bit lost there. Yes. It's sorry, Beth, I think we've lost your connection slightly. Do you have any thoughts in chat, Bev? And we can always read them out. <laughs> There's a smile. There's a smile. The smile. I can see your smile, Bev. We can see your smile, Bev. Can you give a thumbs up, Bev? Looks like the connection's gone, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think the connection's <laughs> gone, unfortunately. Yeah. And that is one of the troubles, isn't it, with them, um, with Microsoft Teams that we do sometimes drop in and in and out or freeze completely, as I did uh, the other day. But um, so that we can pick Beth some comment up if she does come back uh, back to us. But um, what I was going to do really at, at this point was just to uh, offer huge thanks to Mandy for uh, yeah. taking us through the, the wonderful work that's been happening in NHFT volunteering uh, and also setting out some of the things that are developing over the coming uh, months uh, and, and probably years. It really does look like a really exciting space, um, Mandy, and I know certainly from the feedback that we've had from uh, patient service users, from other volunteers, that they're really grateful for the support you and your colleagues are giving them as well. So, so thank you very much um, in, indeed. Um, the other thing I was going to say, of course, aside from just reminding people that the recording of the event will be put up on our uh, website. So if you did want to reflect back on any of Mandy's slides or any of the points, um, you're able and uh, very welcome to, to do so. Uh, the final thing I was going to mention really was to just plug the next of our series of membership events, which is taking place on the 5th of July. Um, we're actually trying um, some different time slots with these events. So the one on the 5th of July is starting at six o'clock in, uh, in the evening. Uh, and this event will be focused on um, well-being. So uh, we'll have some more information coming out about specifically what's going to be happening. But a date for the diary, that's the 5th of July um, at six o'clock again uh, on Microsoft Teams. Uh, Chris. Again, full disclosure, I've been invited to participate with this with David Smart talking about the 10 keys to happier living. There'll be a few of us from our Action for Happiness role talking about how we can look after ourselves and each other. Just as the staff are having their well-being week, then this is something for members. And again, we'll invite members from NHF and um, KGH to join us as well. Indeed. Thanks, Chris. And we'll, we'll certainly be doing a little bit more promotion, as you say. Um, we've tried to time our membership events with other events that are happening. So we mentioned earlier on that we're at the tail end of Volunteer Week, hence uh, having Mandy come on today. And as you mentioned, uh, looking ahead to July when we're launching our, uh, I think it's the second uh, virtual countywide uh, wellbeing festival, actually, um, for, for, for NHS uh, and care staff across the county. That's when we're having our next um, next session. As I mentioned right at the beginning, this is a relatively new venture um, for us. So we are um, really keen to get people's feedback on what we're what we're covering, how we're covering it, and the ideas and suggestions about things we might tee up for future events. So um, please do use the email address that we um, use to register for the event to send us any thoughts or comments. Um, we are hoping also to have a very short um, uh, questionnaire go out. Um, over the coming weeks just to capture your, um, your feedback, um, which equally offers the opportunity to do so um, anonymously because we want to uh, make sure that we're putting on events that are useful and worthwhile for people. So um, 
with that, I think thank you very much indeed um, to Mandy and to everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I wish you uh, a, a, the rest of the a, a good uh, rest of the day and the rest of the week, and hope to see you at the uh, next event. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.